Good evening, our program is underway. Genesis Stones, how they confront evolution. I grew up as a Christian and did not really have any doubts about the Genesis record of creation as I was growing up, going to public high school, didn't have any thoughts of anything except Adam and Eve were real people, like the Bible said, didn't have any real doubts about the Bible. That doesn't say I was a really conservative Christian, the best I should have been, could have been, but nevertheless, I didn't have any qualms about believing the Bible. And as a result of that, I went to the university, and at the university, of course, you normally take the usual biology courses, freshman biology courses, and there you begin to learn a course about biological evolution. First time I'd really heard very much about it. But in the course of the semester, I began to wonder, well, how can this possibly be true? And yet on the other hand, I thought how, you know, why could it be true? That was a pretty big step to go from, you know, non-life to life and then to all the various forms. But that really did not convince me to become an evolutionist. What did convince me to become an evolutionist as I continued to take physics courses, you know, electricity and magnetism, mechanics, optics, nuclear physics, and on and on and on. Every one of those courses was established on verifiable principles. You go into a laboratory, you do experiments, and you verify the fundamental assumptions underlying all of these theories. Well, in the midst of that, however, the introduction of radioactivity came to the fore. And in the same courses I was learning, you know, about nuclear physics and radioactivity, guess what? It was said that indeed the rate of radioactive decay of various radioactive nuclides had always been the same because it's the same right now. You go into a laboratory and you can actually measure the radioactive rate of any radionuclide in the chart of the nuclides. And so it seemed to be a very reasonable assumption. And so as a result of that, though, guess what happened? Geologists and physicists said from the very outset of the discovery of radioactivity around the turn of the century, around 1900, thereabouts, they said very, very quickly, well, you know, if radioactivity and the radioactive particles are decaying at a constant rate, that means something like the element uranium, which has a very, very long half-life, decays very, very slowly. It's in all sorts of rocks. So if we take a rock and measure the amount of uranium in the rock, and then measure the amount of lead, the decay in product, then we should get an idea of the time since the rock formed. In other words, we're using radioactivity or the radioactive product as a clock. Well, I was really, really impressed that this was science. And so as a result of that, while I was at the university, my undergraduate days, I became more and more believing, you know, that the six days of creation were not six literal days at all, but they were six cosmic periods of time. And then I went to graduate school and took a master's degree in physics and there learned all about Big Bang Theory. You know, that the universe itself sprang out of almost nothing and all sorts of particles came out and then eventually the particles became neutrons and protons, the actual constituents of stars. And so the Big Bang then began with hydrogen and helium, hydrogen and helium stars forming over billions of years, and then after a while, supernova, stars blasting away to nothing, but in the process, making other heavier elements. So anyway, as I went then from my master's program into the defense industry, working in nuclear weapons analysis at that time, because at that time, the Cold War was still very much in progress, I argued very, very, very vehemently in favor of evolution with all my colleagues, and they wondered, why is this guy so taken up with evolution? And I said, well, doesn't anyone as a physicist or a scientist recognize that you can use radioactivity as a clock? And so therefore, as a result of that, guess what can happen? What can happen is that essentially you can age date the rocks, and if you can age date the rocks, you can age date then the fossils in the rocks, and as a result of that, you have a scientific basis for not only the age of the Earth, the ancient age of the Earth, and the, and the cosmos itself, but also of the Darwinian, what? Theory of the origin of the species, us. We're all walking around, supposedly, you know, the product of evolution. Well, something happened. I was uh, in the defense industry out west at that particular time in Fort Worth. Then something happened, and I returned 
returned, went to Orlando, Florida to another defense agency. And at that time, I also began working in the same field, meaning nuclear weapons effects, at this other aircraft company. Very, very soon after I got there, I became very good friends with an atheist. First name was Kurt. After a while, we became more and more friends. One Monday morning, he comes into work and he tells me, Bob, you know, I saw this program on television last night. You ought to look at it. It's sort of unusual. Next week, I looked at it. And the guy was a preacher. The man was a preacher. And I thought, well, he sounds interesting. Now, you remember that, indeed, in the process of becoming an evolutionist, my Christian beliefs did not fully, completely fade away. But I no longer had any belief in Genesis or the six literal days of creation. But in any event, when I began to watch this television program with my wife, guess what happened? I thought, well, you know, maybe, I'm, maybe I need to read the Bible a little bit more. So I began to read the Bible a little bit more. And as I read the Bible a little bit more, guess what I found? To my amazement, and I brought my Bible with me tonight, and if I can find it very quickly, I'll read one of the passages that caused me some consternation. It's uh, in the book of John. Now remember, I had not been reading the Bible for many, many years for all practical purposes. But here in the New Testament, the book of John, uh, Jesus is talking with the scribes and the Pharisees. And they were having a big argument with him about who he was and where he came from. And it says that indeed, you have not known him. Jesus is saying now to the scribes and Pharisees, you have not known him, meaning the Father in heaven. I know him. If I said I do not know him, I should be a liar like you. But I do know him. I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he was able to see my day. He saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, You are not yet 50 years old, and you have seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went off out of the temple. Well, that intrigued me because I know that there's a cross-reference there to the book of Exodus, the third chapter, in which Moses was at the burning bush, and there I read that indeed when Moses said to God in the burning bush, who should I say sent me to the children of Israel to lead you out and go to the promised land? And God says right there in Exodus, the third chapter, say, I am that I am. That's the name I want you to tell them, I am that I am. And I thought, wait a minute. That means that the I am, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ designated himself as the I am, and that's why they took up stones to throw at him, because they recognized that he took upon himself the divine name of God that, was, that God spoke to Moses way back in Mount Sinai. What does that mean? What effect did that have? What implications did it have? Very, very quickly, here's what happened. Remember, I was way off on the other end of the spectrum. I was a person, because of my science, believing the Earth and the cosmos had been here for billions and billions of years. But now, all of a sudden, I was confronted with, who wrote the Ten Commandments? The Bible says it, it was written by the finger of God on the tables of stone and given to Moses. Who wrote? Whose finger was that? In his pre-human form, I could easily see that according to these passages, that was Jesus Christ. That was the Jesus Christ that I claimed to believe in even though I'd become an evolutionist. I thought to myself, something is wrong because right there in Exodus 20, 11, it says, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth to see and all that in them is. Now, that's a repeat of Genesis 1 and 2, the six days of Genesis. You see, I could reconcile away or I could reason away the idea that the days of Genesis might be six long cosmic periods of time. But then when I saw Exodus 20, 11 saying, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth to see and all that in them is, I saw something else I hadn't seen before. There in that same sentence, the six days of creation were re-mentioned along with the seventh day. Now I knew the Jews worshiped on the seventh day and some other people did as well. So I figured how could it possibly be that the seventh day being a real day in that particular passage how is it possible that the other six days could be long cosmic periods of time? So I began to ask the question to myself and others, well, you know, there's something wrong because if I trace back the chronology of the Bible, genealogies of the Bible from the New Testament to the Old back to Adam and Eve, simply it comes out to be about 6,000 years. I believed it was over several billion years ago that the earth formed and was, was formed and according to the Big Bang Theory, so I had a huge, huge uh, dilemma. 
People told me, don't worry about it. You can, mis you can interpret or reinterpret Genesis 1 to believe anything you want to. You can say the earth here was billions of years and on and on and on. Don't let that bother you, that there is this big difference between what the Bible says, genealogies, and the scientific evidence for an ancient age of the earth. Well, anyway, I couldn't let it go. My wife and I decided, you know, that we need to find out the answer. Well, who are we to find out the answer? In any event, uh, I left the defense industry after that particular time and went to teach for a while, and then I began to teach at a little college up in Washington State, and nobody can answer my question. How do you guys reconcile the fact that indeed as scientists, physicists, the world believes that indeed it's several billion years old and the cosmos is 13 to 14 billion years old, and yet here in the Bible, very, very plainly, plainly, as far as I can tell, the six days of creation were six literal days, and it only goes back to about 6,000 years, he said, man, don't worry about this. So anyway, I left that little college in Washington State. Because there was such great emphasis on getting a PhD at that little college, I decided, well, I'll see if I can get a PhD in physics and maybe somewhere along the line uh, find the answer. So I got a teaching position then at Georgia Tech Institute of Technology, which you all know about down in Atlanta. And so I was teaching down there as an instructor, and I was taking coursework toward a PhD in physics. And I became acquainted, of course, with the chairman of the physics department. And I went to him very soon after we got there, my wife and I got there, and um, I said, you know, I've got to decide on a thesis topic. You know I've got to decide on a thesis topic for a PhD. And he said, well, you know, we've got several, you know, you can do this, you can do that, the other. And I said, well, I've got a suggestion myself. And my suggestion is I want to reinvestigate the topic of the age of the Earth. You want to reinvestigate the topic of the age of the Earth? I said, he said to me, Bob, the whole scientific community, physicists have been working on this thing, you know, 50, 60, 70 years. What are you thinking about? And I told him, well, I had begun to read the Bible again very, very carefully, and I see a contradiction. And I don't like to live, I don't want to live my life with a contradiction of believing partially in what I think is the truth in the Bible and believing the scientific truth that I have believed in. So that's why I want to do a reinvestigation of the topic of the age of the earth. So we went out to eat from time to time at lunchtime. We became friends. And uh, every time we met, every time we met, I'd bring up the topic. I want to do my thesis on the age of the earth. Every time we did, he said, Bob, don't do it. Just forget about it, man. Forget about it. Finally, the day came. He said, now look, after I told him again, I wanted to do my thesis. He said, now look, here's the situation. You are against the world. All the physicists in the world, for practical purposes, believe the age of the Earth is several billion years. You're going to sit there and tell me you want to do a reinvestigation of something that vast numbers of physicists have already looked into and they found it's okay. But he said, I will tell you, however, Bob, when I was young, like you were, like I was at that time, very young, he said, I wondered about it, but I didn't let it destroy my life. I decided that indeed if the physicists of the world decided this was truth, that was good enough for me. But I said, here's, he said to me, here's the situation. If I were to let you do your thesis topic on the age of the earth, then suppose, he said, first of all, I think your chances of finding something would be microscopic. Microscopic. But he said, nevertheless, even though I think they're microscopic, just what if you found something that was really tiny microscopic? about the theory of evolution, something that just would throw a little tiny question to the whole issue. What you would want to do, of course, is to publish a paper. You would have to publish it in the name of the physics department at Georgia Tech. But the fact of the matter is that indeed, even if you were to do that, you would throw embarrassment over all the scientists here in Georgia the Institute of Technology. There would be chaos, no matter how small that report might happen to be. And he said, Bob, I just cannot take the chance You've got to decide. If you want to do something on the age of the earth and investigate it, that's up to you. But you will not be able to stay here at Georgia Tech and use that as a thesis topic. End of argument. So I decided that finding the truth about this was more important than staying and trying to get a PhD with some other topic. So I left. I didn't have any visible means of support. That summer, I went up to Halifax, Nova Scotia, borrowed money to go up there, and I'll tell you why in just a minute. But in any event, that fall I taught uh, high school mathematics there in Sandy Springs, Georgia, just to keep things together. Now, here's the issue. 
The issue is I found out that there is a basis, a basis, so to speak, that physicists have believed in for many, many years, decades, nearly 100 years. They believe that indeed there's something in the rocks, little tiny circles in the rocks produced by uranium, rings, so to speak. Those circles will, if you look at them carefully enough, do what? They'll be produced in the rocks of the Earth. And those little tiny circles then will tell you, depending upon their size, they will tell you whether indeed the decay rate of uranium and all the other radioactive elements has been constant. There's a bell ringing for some reason. <laughs> In any event, it's probably because my PowerPoint slides are not functioning as they should be functioning right now. I have someone in the audience whom I ask to come to my rescue. If, if he would please do that now and get this going, it would be appreciated. In the meantime, I'm going to continue. And that is that I wanted the radioactive elements, radioactive circles that I was looking for, I wanted to be looking for, were in granite rocks. And those granite rocks, it turns out, someone up in Halifax, Nova Scotia had worked on for many, many decades in the 1930s. Well, I, as I said, I borrowed money to go up to Halifax, Nova Scotia, and to get samples then of the samples of granite that had been used in the investigations in the 1930s. So as a result of that, I went up there and came back. <clears throat> I was still employed at Georgia Tech at that particular time, and the next semester as I worked and was teaching there at Georgia Tech, I spent my spare time looking under the microscope looking under the microscope for these little tiny circles. And as a result of that, we got the help that we needed. Thank you so much. A friend in need. Here it is. And there's something that's microscopic, seen under the microscope, and what does it mean? They're found in granite specks in mica samples, okay? Now, that mica, or this granite itself, Mount Rushmore granite, you all are familiar with that. That's granite. It's called a crystalline rock. The foundations of the granite rocks are deep in the earth. What did the evolutionists think about them? Well, we're going to find that out in just a minute. But as I looked at these circles under the rocks with the microscope during that year, guess what happened? I saw more than I, I thought I was going to be seeing. I saw a, a little disc-like structure with a center. Then I saw two circles around a center. Then I saw halos, they're called halos, with three circles around the center. Now this one, we won't try to get into a whole lot of technical details tonight, but you can identify the actual radioactivity that produced this three-circle pattern by doing what? By measuring the radius of the rings. Particles went out from the center, and they have a certain energy, and they produce rings as a result. So for example, how did this one form? Well, there was radioactivity in that little tiny center at one time. What happened is particles shot out from that center. You can see the illustration right there. Particles shot out. Then another set of particles shot out from that center. It's called a genetic sequence. One particle shooting after and going to another element, shooting out part uh, particles. And then other particles shot out from that particular center. And guess what? You begin to form then spherical regions of colored spheres. And if you actually slice it, through the, through the center and put it under the microscope, you see the little dot there in the center, and then you see these three rings. And you see these terms called polonium at the bottom, polonium 210, polonium 214, polonium 218. That simply means you can associate those rings with the energy of the particles shot out from that little center. How did Mount Rushmore supposedly form? Supposedly it, it was a magma, hot magma cooling down over millions and hundreds of millions of years before it finally cooled, as is indicated, of course, in the slide that you're seeing on the screen. Molten, then semi-molten, then after many millions of years, everything hardens, and then all of a sudden something happens, a geological event of some kind happens, and everything then protrudes on the surface. And there you see Mount Rushmore. Of course, at that time, of course, they didn't have the faces of Washington and Jefferson and the other presidents. But now, here's the problem. Here's El Capitan at Yosemite. That supposedly sea formed deep in the earth from a hot molten magma cooling over millions and millions of years of time, finally being pushed up. But the problem that was appearing to me over the period of time I was looking, over a couple of years, 
I saw that these three ring halos we just saw were produced by a type of radioactivity, remember it was polonium-218, polonium-218 with a half-life of three minutes. Three minutes? What does that mean? Well, my son David, who will be with us tomorrow night, is going to tell us a little bit about that. We can demonstrate the principle of polonium radio halos. Imagine this Alka-Seltzer tablet is a bit of polonium, and this glass of water is a piece of molten granite. I drop the tablet in, and it begins to fizz. Think of these bubbles as the radiation emitted by that bit of polonium embedded in the granite. This fizz will go away in about 30 seconds and we'll have nothing left but a slightly tangy glass of water. Now, is there any way we could preserve these bubbles as they are? We could try placing the glass in the freezer. The water, of course, would solidify after a while. That's something similar to what evolutionary theory suggests, that molten rock slowly cools to form granite. But as you've already guessed, freezing this glass of Alka-Seltzer wouldn't do any good the bubbles will have gone long before the water turns to ice. And that's exactly what would have happened to polonium radiation if the granite had slowly cooled. It would have disappeared long before any radio halos could have been imprinted in the solid rock. If I show you a frozen glass of water with all the fizz of a tablet still intact, like this, you will know that something happened to instantly freeze the water. In this case, we merely froze it instantly in time by a pause of the videotape. Likewise, if we look at a radio halo demonstrated unmistakably to have been produced by a certain kind of polonium, we can know that the granite around it had to be formed instantly. Instantly. These are the thoughts that occurred to me at that time. I was looking under the microscope many, many years ago now, and I was wondering how in the world could it possibly be that that radioactivity could exist over millions and millions of years of time and do what? It's like putting, as David said, Alka-Seltzer in water, it's going to fizz and disappear in a minute. Only if it were instantly frozen would it last. So what that meant was that indeed these ideas, this biblical passages flashed in my mind when I was looking at it under the microscope one day. What were those passages? Psalm 33, 6 and 9. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. I was awed. I was just taken back. I was stunned to realize, in my opinion, the God of heaven had actually placed his fingerprints of creation in earth's foundation rocks when he created the earth. So that means that indeed, yes, Half Dome at Yosemite was part of the earth's foundation rocks which God called into existence. And not only that, but he wanted people to understand in the last days of this world's history that he left his scientific imprints there so that people don't have to wonder about the age of the earth or anything else. Listen, if you're going to have the instant formation of granite, granite's forming instead of over hundreds of billions and hundreds of millions and billions of years of time, compressed to only a couple of minutes, then indeed you see that the creator of the universe has stepped into the affairs of this world to try to help us all to understand that indeed exactly what the Bible says about creation in Genesis and there in Exodus 11, Exodus 20, verse 11, it's true. So that night I went to see some friends of mine and I said, listen, 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 here's what happened today. I had this idea flash in my mind, these biblical passages about the implications of these halos and I'm seeing, and they said, Bob, listen, you gotta be careful, you may be wrong. Went down to Georgia where some people were supporting my wife and I at the rate of $300 a month and I told them the same thing. They were tremendously hopeful, of course, that something would come out of whatever. I told them the same thing. They said, Bob, you gotta be careful. You may be wrong. So I instantly recognized then that no one was ever gonna to listen to anything I had to say unless I started to publish scientific papers as a result of that. Well, first of all, here's what I say. At this point, granite foundation rocks are God's Genesis stones. In the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. In other words, God in Hebrews 1.10 specified the foundations of the earth. Those rocks are the rocks that he specially created and that's what these Genesis halos are found in, evidence of the rapid creation. So where do we go after that? Well, I went and even my, I just carved a little tiny laboratory out of one bedroom of our home and kicked out the kids in one of the bedrooms 
And I sent in a paper to Applied Physics Letters. I won't try to read everything. I'll just tell you basically what was going on. Notice that in the last sentence there, I say, <clears throat> these halos represent extinct natural radioactivity from the cosmological standpoint. I'm going to explain exactly what that means in just a minute. I want to let you know, however, that was one of my first attempts to communicate this, what I believe was a discovery, <clears throat> to the worldwide scientific, in, scientific community. Well, then the referee, though, gets that report, and he goes on to say, you know, he concludes, me, I conclude the Earth was formed in, by instantaneous fiat. In one blow, he implicitly rejects all the carefully accumulated evidence of decades which is in complete conflict with this remarkable conclusion. He goes on to say, however, that if I'd leave that out, and just talk about the actual observations, you know, in nature, that might, that might get something going. So I did that. I actually sent a paper into nature way back 67. I was a very, very young man at that particular time. And again, in this paper in Nature Magazine at that particular time, Nature, a worldwide scientific journal of repute, and I put in the words, extinct radioactivity found in the polonium halos. Extinct natural radioactivity again. What's this all about? Well, the whole issue here about these polonium halos is whether the radioactivity that produced those rings we just talked about was there originally when the rock itself crystallized, or whether some way, somehow, radioactivity had migrated to that center, and that's why the halos then formed. In other words, some way of actually getting secondary polonium there from some source of uranium. The problem, of course, there wasn't any source of, any, of uranium anywhere nearby. But anyway, it occurred to me, I went to see a scientist there uh, at that time and moved to Washington, D.C. and was working at a little college up there in Tacoma Park, Maryland. And I went to see Wallace Brody, the Foreign Secretary of the American Chemical Society, and told him what I had found. He said, Bob, this is what I suggest you do. You need to write all this up, do a whole series of experiments, and write it all up and send it into science, which is actually at that particular time and still is one of the world's finest and most read scientific journals. It goes everywhere around the world. You get a paper in there and you're going to get notice. So I did a series of experiments. Now basically in the next few slides I'll try to illustrate very quickly what those experiments were all about. The whole idea, remember, is the following. Either the radioactivity that formed those rings was there when the rock had formed or some way, somehow, it came in afterward. But remember, the half-life was only three minutes. So anyway, we did a whole series of experiments over a period of seven or eight months, and there turned out to be a way you can tell whether indeed any excess or any secondary radioactivity was feeding that inclusion. What was it? Suppose you have a, you know, a circle of soldiers now, and they're all marching toward the center of that halo, so to speak, and they're leaving their tracks. As they get closer, what do you see? A whole series of tracks, but they're all pointing toward the center. And as they get closer and closer, what do you see? A whole series of tracks pointing even closer and closer and closer. <laughs> That's not what we found. In other words, we did some experiments. We didn't find any indication whatsoever of the tracks of radioactive decay accumulating near the center. Instead, it was like the tracks are just everywhere, which is what you expect because uranium is distributed throughout mica minerals, but a very, very small amount. So that was the essence of the report then I sent into science. I sent it into science in 1967. And now I'm basically, this experimental evidence indicates, this is me saying now, what it amounts to is that indeed, again, I say the last sentence, these halos represent extinct natural radioactivity. We've said that about three or four times. I've been putting it in the reports as far as possible. What does it all mean? Well, now, here it comes to a referee. He sees those words. And in the middle there, you can see that it says that indeed, indeed, it, my pointer here is not working very well, my laser. In any event, it says that indeed, he understands what I mean by extinct natural radioactivity. Let's go to the next slide. What does it mean? This is now in the referee report. Does he, Gentry, mean to imply that current cosmological and geological theories are possibly so wrong that all the events leading from galactic or even protosolar nucleosynthesis to the formation of crustal rock minerals could have taken place in a few minutes? All right, we're going to use a schematic to help you understand what he's saying there in technical terms. In the Big Bang evolutionary scenario, there's something called supernova. You hear about supernova all the time. They're blow, blowing up around the universe. What you don't hear so much about is the fact that indeed 
All of us tonight, everything here tonight, is not the result of the Big Bang per se. Only at that time, hydrogen and helium were supposedly formed. Where did all the other elements come from that indeed we're made of here tonight? Supposedly, they were formed in the supernova. Stars blowing up, nuclear reactions, and more and more heavier elements were formed. But guess what? And this is what always puzzled me even when I was an evolutionist. In the very fact, the fact that indeed the supernova blowing up, what's happening to the products of the explosion? Well, it's moving apart, 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 apart. You can see that in the photographs taken by Hubble Space Telescope and other telescopes. The actual explosion of the supernova is spreading it out all over, all over, all over. But what cosmologists believe is that some way, somehow, billions and billions of supernova have exploded, and then these heavier elements in these explosions, they're moving outward, moving outward, moving outward from the point of explosion, but some way, somehow, billions of them begin, the products of the billions of them begin to do what? Reaccumulate. If you fire an artillery shell at an airplane, as people do in the war, of course, the artillery shell explodes and the particles, the fragments then try to penetrate the airplane. The fragments do not ever reaccumulate to the actual original shell. And yet that's what the Big Bang Theory says, that some way, somehow, the supernova particles, elements that are produced in the supernova, some way, somehow, throughout the vast reaches of the universe and time, they reaccumulate to form what? Another star, second generation star. Second generation star has heavier elements than the first one because the first one only contained hydrogen and helium. On the infinitum, it goes on and on like that, so that supposedly we here tonight are the result of not just one, but many, 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 many thousands, maybe millions of supernova in distant past. Anyway, that's what he was saying. This referee was saying, I understand that indeed in the Big Bang Theory, supernova, that's when everything was formed. But here is extinct natural radioactivity is the radioactivity that lasted long enough from those supernova explosions to the time the Earth forms. So extinct natural radioactivity may be radioactivity that was formed in at supernova, but it almost decayed away before the Earth solidified, and so there are bare remnants, not of the original radioactivity itself, but there are decay products, something left over, the residual, the end products. And so people have been looking for extinct natural radioactivity because they want to find the time period, if possible, between when the supernova occurred, when our original elements were formed, and the time that the Earth forms. That's usually thought to be in the millions and millions of years. Well, what he was saying in that referee report was that he understood me to say what? From these polonium halos, he understood me to say that indeed, he got very close to me saying this, that indeed it's on day one of creation. That's what I really meant. Day one of creation and the extinct natural radioactivity is now not in the millions of years, but it's in the, only in three minutes to the time that the planet itself was formed. Instant creation. That's what indeed the referee was asking about. He did something that almost never is done. When he wrote the referee report back to science, he signed his name and he said, I want to get in, I want Gentry to contact me, I want to find out what's going on. So immediately when I got his referee report from the science, I called him long distance right then and there. I said, I'm Bob Gentry, you said you're interested in talking with me, here I am. He said, what are you talking about in this paper that you're trying to get published through science, of which I am a referee? I said, very simply, it's fiat creation. God left evidence of his creative power bringing the earth into existence an instant of time. Now this man was a world-renowned scientist they sent this paper to, and there are many, many other details I could relate in reference to this, but there he was on the other end, long distance and so forth. His remark was, you know, uh, my, grandfather was a my grandfather was a Methodist minister, but he was not a minister. He was not, as far as I can tell, a Christian. He was a thorough-going believer in several billion year age of the earth and the billions and billions of years of Big Bang. Anyway, he stayed on the telephone and began then to ask me questions, more and more technical questions about the paper. And anyway, he said, um, you really want to get this paper published? I see, and I said, of course so. He said, well, I suggest some other experiments you need to do before you convince me that indeed this radioactivity you're talking about here 
it is really primordial radioactivity. In other words, people, he knew that other people were thinking about secondary radioactivity, secondary radioactivity. I was having to convince him that indeed it was primordial. In other words, the radioactivity was there when the rock formed. It was there when the rock formed. It's all over. Those halos are evidence of fiat creation. So, as a result of that, I said, fine, I'll do the experiments. I had someone who was a friend down <coughs> at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory at that particular time. And uh, fortunately, uh, he was able to get me into the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and there was a whole series of experiments that needed to be done to buttress this idea, the fact that indeed one radioactive decay would leave a track. Remember we saw the track prints of the soldiers? Well, indeed, each one of the radioactive decays of supposedly any radioactivity feeding the centers of these polonium halos, that was going to leave a track in the mica itself, on the surface of the mica. Did a series of many, many experiments at Oak Ridge at that time and found that indeed one particle decay left a track. So there's no question about that. Then indeed the very fact is that there were no excess tracks. There was no excess radioactivity feeding those centers. Well, after I did that, and by the way, he said, uh, come back and see me after you get all these experiments done and I'll talk to you again. Now in the meantime, <coughs> I, uh, the paper I'd been through several back and forth with the editor, associate editor of the paper at that particular time, and uh, one time he sent the earlier re referee reports, he sent me back and he said, the referee said, you know, this paper is not, not going to be valid because it conflicts with the usual way of looking at the age and history of the earth and cosmos. Anyway, it turns out he did not send me as he should have in the letter that indeed said that, you know, here's the report from the referee. This is now several months earlier. And so um, he called me and, and he, I got the letter and it did not have the referee report. So I asked him if I could come down and talk with him and I did. Went down and talked to him and he said, how old do you think the earth is? I said, 6,000 years. I said, here's the evidence of Earth's fiat creation. He said, well, you know, I've got referee reports back here saying you shouldn't, we shouldn't publish your paper. But as I read the referee reports, I said, well, did you read the referee report? This is now earlier. He said, well, no, I didn't. I said, well, here, why don't you read it and we'll talk about it. I was there for about an hour and a half. And he said, all right, I'll send this paper out to other referees. And the referee, one of the referees I was telling you about was this man at Carnegie Mellon University who called me said he wanted to talk to me and so forth. As that was under, as that, as I was doing those experiments at Oak Ridge, rewriting the paper and so forth, I got a letter from George Gamow. Now, most of you probably don't know anything about George Gamow. He was a renowned scientist there on the, in the 20th century, a man who's termed in some respects the father of the Big Bang. Anyway, I got a letter from him inviting me to speak at a colloquium at the University of Colorado in October. Now, of 1967. Remember, I was a young man at that time. So I said, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. You know, George Gamow is interested in my work. How did he know about this? Well, it was that paper I published in Nature just a year earlier. So anyway, I was getting ready, very, very happy to go out and speak at the colloquium and so forth. Uh, there was one reservation I had. And in the meantime, however, George uh, Gamow invited me to come and stay at his home with his wife while I was there speaking at the University of Colorado. However, in the process of that, I informed uh, actually him and his family, his wife, that indeed I was a vegetarian. And uh, I have someone here tonight who will give a little testimony about that situation. She's sitting right over here, and she's going to come up right now. It happens to be, happens to be my, my wife of many, many years. Honey, what happened um, as a result of my contact with George Gamow? Well, you can imagine. I was. I couldn't believe that the wife of one of the most famous scientists in the world would call me. And what did she want to know from me? She said, really? She said, I found out that your husband is a vegetarian. And I would like to know if that includes fish and chicken. And, and what did you say? I said, well, no, it doesn't. I said, he only eats fruits and vegetables. But I said, as far as desserts are concerned, he will eat eggs if you have them in your cake or your pies. And he, I'm sure he will appreciate anything that you have for him. 
And I thought it was very thoughtful that she took the time to call me. Thank you. Thank you. Especially she included the desserts, of course. In any, in any event, um, turns out that I went out there expecting to give the colloquium on time, went to the uh, chairman of the physics department that afternoon, Thursday afternoon. Turns out, by the way, uh, there was a pastor there, and I went to his house and told him, I said, really, I do need prayer before I go over here because here's what's happened. Just a few months earlier, there in Boulder, pardon me, in Denver, uh, there was a live radio talk show, widely listened to all over Colorado, and they had invited me to be on that program. I was on that program five hours, from 7 o'clock to 12 o'clock that night. Anyway, the guy in the, he was a, in the chemistry department at the University of Colorado there in Boulder, but he was on that radio talk show. He was interviewing me. He was very, very, very unfriendly for five hours. And he was doing anything in the world he could to undercut the evidence that I was presenting for fiat creation, the halos that I had found. In any event, though, much, much later on in the evening, he had many, many buddies there at the University of Colorado calling in and being very, very insulting and everything. However, around 11 o'clock at night or thereabouts, those buddies, uh, they all had said what they could say and others were calling in. One gentleman called in and he said to this man who was interviewing me, the professor of the chemistry there at the University of Colorado, he said, uh, tell me now, you've been criticizing this man for four or five hours. Uh, tell me, uh, he says he's been doing research and he has been publishing papers and here's references of paper that you pu he's published and you just barely mentioned it tonight. What qualifications do you have for calling his work into question? Uh, well, I've been doing research. I've been doing a library research over the last day or two. The, the caller said, you have been doing library research? What do you mean? I, I, I've read. I've read a little bit about what he's doing. And he, the caller said, do I understand then that you don't have any laboratory evidence? You've just been reading what he's done. Is that right? Well, the guy just hit the ceiling because it, reckon, it helped everyone to recognize, of course, he hadn't done any experimental work itself. I'd been doing experimental work, publishing papers, and yet he was making it appear as if you know all the work that I'd done and all the results were just off the wall. Anyway, the whole uh, perception of the radio interview turned on that particular point, and after that, people were calling in very, very friendly. But anyway, come now to October then, 1967, uh, I was to be there at the University of Colorado where this physics, pardon me, this chemistry professor was located, and guess what? They put up signs all over the university that I was gonna be speaking on this topic of the age of the earth and the halos and so forth, and so as all the evidence in the world that this chemistry professor was gonna have it in for me, come there to the colloquium and tell everybody there, after I gave my colloquium, this guy, you know, he believes that indeed he's found evidence for fiat creation, the God of heaven, actually calling this world into existence. We all know that's got to be wrong. We all know it's, we thought, you know, I thought to myself, this is gonna kill the chances, any chances I had of this paper being published because guess what, I found out that George Gamow was going to be a referee of the paper. So anyway, that night before the colloquium, when I came in, I called George Gamow, and his wife answered the phone, the wife that uh, my wife spoke to earlier, and she said, oh brother, Dr. Gentry, uh, I'm sorry, you won't be able to come here because my husband, George Gamow, is in the hospital. He's recovering from carotid artery surgery, but he wants to see you, he wants to go to the hospital, he wants to talk with you, he's alert and everything. So I went to the hospital and talked to him for a while. Most unusual thing happened. I knew his reputation. He's the man with respect to this extinct natural radioactivity that knows as much as anybody in the world about it. And I thought, that's the reason why he's so interested. Well, that was one of the reasons. But as I talked to him and I talked to him that night about what I had found and discovered, guess what? He didn't understand. Over and over and over again, I tried to communicate to him the implications, and he didn't understand. It was like, you know, he would I'd say this, and he would say something else, he would say this, and he would comment, and he said, basically, he came around and said, you know, well, I hope you have a good colloquium tomorrow, I wanna to hear about it. 
So anyway, went to that colloquium the next day, thinking that indeed if the chemistry professor was going to be there and basically tell everybody, you know, I'm a creationist and everything, they would get back to George Gamow. George Gamow would say no to the paper, never be published. But when I went to the actual physics department on Thursday afternoon, went in, told the secretary who I was, she said, oh, Dr. Jerry, here's the entry, here's the problem. The head of the physics department has had to leave because, guess what, he's come down with the flu. Then she said, number two, the second man in charge and others on the physics department, most of them are not going to be here this afternoon. The whole colloquium in physics is going to be almost canceled except you're here, and so the grad students and several faculty members will be there to hear you because Gamow wants to hear a report about what's going on. So why was everyone so, why wasn't there going to be much of a colloquium? Why wasn't, why was there so much chaos on the campus? Turns out the week or two before, the CIA recruiters had come to the campus and they had been recruiting. And the University of Colorado Senate faculty had gotten all up in arms about that recruiting. They had called an emergency meeting of the Senate faculty that afternoon. And guess what time? Four o'clock, a scheduled time for my colloquium. So I gave my colloquium, very, very friendly. Afterwards, some of the faculty members said, George Gamow was really interested in your work. And I said, I'm very thankful of that. Anyway, I left to go back to um, Tennessee, to Maryland at that particular time. Went back and told the associate editor there, his name was John, we'll say his name was John, what happened there in Colorado. And I said, you know, I, I suspect that that's gonna get a positive. I suspect Gamow is gonna okay my paper, but I don't know that. Anyway, getting back now to this other man, this man at Carnegie Mellon University. I went and did experiments there at the University of, University at Oak Ridge National Laboratory and rewrote the report, called him up, and he said, all right, come on up here to Carnegie Mellon University. I want to see what you've got. I went up there. He picked me up at the airport, took me to the uh, Carnegie Mellon. On the way to the airport, we got into the discussion of creation again. He said, you know, what do you believe about the fossils? Do you believe the devil put the fossils in the rocks? I said, no, I don't believe the devil put the fossils in the rocks. Went back to his office that day and paragraph by paragraph and word by word, Period by period, he went over the entire manuscript, the new manuscript that I had sent in. Guess what? He said, you found something that I cannot explain. But on the way back, he took me back to the airport, but he said this, Bob, now I want to tell you, if you put anything in your paper that this is evidence that God created the earth, I'll turn it down. I said, okay, okay. So anyway, that was in January. He had the paper. He was reviewing the paper. This was the last last, last, last event before publication or acceptance. January, February, March, April, May, I kept calling the editorial office and I got into such good, I became so well acquainted with the gentleman who was handling it and then the editorial office, John by name, we'll say. I kept saying, John, have you ever gotten a report back from Carnegie Mellon and Carnegie Mellon and Carnegie Mellon? And he said, no, Bob, I, I've written and written and written. I don't know why they're not, I don't know why this particular scientist, Coleman, is not giving me a report. So anyway, they finally came, though, it was in May. I called up again. I said, you know, you heard about me before, you know, my name is so-and-so Bob Gentry. I want to talk to John about this paper. She said, I'm sorry, John is in the hospital. I think it was appendectomy and so forth. So uh, he's not here. I said, well, can you let me talk to somebody who knows anything about this paper I've had in from publication? What's the name of it? I told her, variant radioactive halos and so forth. She went and looked, she said, we don't have any paper by, in publication by that name. I said, please, 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 it's been in for publication for almost a year. It's been in and out of referees and so forth. You've got to have a record. She went back and said, there is no record of any paper like that in for publication. I said, please, I know the paper is somewhere. I don't think anyone destroyed it. I know John isn't there. She said, well, there's one place it could be. I'll go look. Comes back on the telephone, she says, well, it is here after all. It's on the copy editor's desk. I said, the copy editor's desk? She said, yes. What is it doing on the copy editor's desk? As if I didn't know. It's been accepted for publication. Accepted for publication? Yes. You're gonna be receiving the proofs here shortly. Thank you. Now hang up. My wife and I went and prayed the God of heaven who had led and guided and directed, and there are many, many other evidences of God's providence in the process of that paper getting that far. We thank the Lord for what had happened. 
We also knew that the last step had yet to be taken. Anyway, I got the proofs of the paper and there were a few things I needed to change. So I actually made the changes, went back down to science and talked to the copy editor himself and said, I think these changes need to be made. He said, give me the manuscript. He wrote them out. He said, here it is. I, he put it in the basket to be printed. Then I got the second set of final proofs. He sent it to me and I said, Pat and I said, praise the Lord, we've come this far. Basically that manuscript says that indeed those radioactive halos were formed by primordial radioactivity and the only way to explain it then is that indeed they were put there as evidence of fiat creation of the granite rocks all over the world. Anyway, shortly thereafter in June 1968, that paper was published. If you want to see a copy of that paper, first of all, we'll see if we can. There it is, Science, Volume 160, 1968, pages 1228 to 1230. If you want to see a copy of this paper, go to my website, halos, dot com and go to reports and you'll find a copy of this paper in that website. Many, many other things began to happen. I thought immediately this has gone out in the world's most significant scientific journal to hundreds of thousands of scientists. It won't be long before there's going to be a great outcry that something has gone wrong, that this paper presenting this evidence for basically radioactivity that lasted only for a few minutes and then it's gone and it's recorded in basement granite foundation rocks all over the world, I thought surely I was going to get a big response. Guess what? Nothing happened. Well, as a result of that, I thought that something more has got to be done. This whole issue of me presenting scientific evidence to the world it's not working for me to be here at this little college. Nobody's paying any attention to me, despite the fact that it's gone out to the world's prestigious scientific journal all over the world. So as a result of that, a few months later, and we'll pick this up again tomorrow evening, we'll pick this up tomorrow evening, I decided it got to be some other way. So my wife had been praying with me for a long period of time that some way, somehow, me, of nobody, would be able to have access, be on the staff of an national laboratory where I could have the world's best scientific equipment to do more and more experiments to explore this whole issue more and more and more with scientists, you know, basically there and from around the world. And surely that particular fall, guess what happened? I was in the process of looking through the thousands and thousands of mineral samples that I had collected and other people had sent me from around the world. And as I examined all those samples, I saw something I had never seen before, and that was basically... The telltale signature of that radioactivity appearing out of nowhere for a few moments, leaving its mark in hard granite, speaks to us of an instant creation like the frozen bubbles in the glass of Alka-Seltzer. Something extraordinary happened when these rocks were formed something that defies all the physical laws that we presently observe. The evidence is captured in the granite. And we can see with a microscope creation's tiny mystery, polonium halos. They are a mystery only to those who are determined to stick with their theory of an Earth billions of years old. For those willing to consider the Genesis account of a recent rapid creation, the halos are perfectly understandable. They fit the biblical picture being found in the very rocks called into existence in the beginning of creation week. In the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. Polonium radio halos offer hard evidence that the earth's foundational rocks, the granites, were created almost instantly. To Dr. Robert Gentry, those faintly colored rings are almost like the fingerprints of God, the signature of creation. As you leave tonight, if you want, there will be flyers, and you can actually see this is a part of the products that have been made about this particular topic and have been aired on public broadcasting, in fact. But this particular segment was taken from the DVD, Fingerprints of Creation. 
But let me continue just in case, for example, as I was indicating, this paper that was published in Science did not actually obtain the kind of reception or the reaction that I was hoping. I was hoping that this would become something in the center of the scientific attention. Whenever a discovery is made of any great significance, usually, guess what happens? The topic is brought to the center of scientific discussion for examination, for examination, and for discussion, and for analysis. This did not happen when this paper was published in 1968. It did not appear as if it was going to happen. But in any event, in the fall then of that year, I was looking at all the mineral samples, as I will talk about more tomorrow night, I was looking at all the mineral samples that I had in my possession, thousands of them, and I came across something which I had not seen before. That is, this is now what we call a giant radioactive halo, produced by a type of radioactivity that no one had ever known anything about. Well, what was I going to do? First of all, it was in my cabinet with all my other minerals, but for some reason I did not have any ID paper with it. I didn't know where it came from. I, didn't, I did not remember where I got it. But in any event, what I did, however, do was to call the office of the chairman of the United States Atomic Energy Commission in downtown Washington, D.C., and tell him basically the United States Atomic Energy Commission is interested in the possible discovery of new radioactive elements. Here's what I found. We don't know what it is now. Within a half an hour, within 45 minutes, I got an appointment to go down to downtown Washington, D.C. and actually speak with the chairman of the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission with his assistant, Justin Bloom. I showed him the pictures of what I had found. He said, can I take these pictures? I'm about ready to go to the Lawrence Radiation Laboratory there in Berkeley, and I want to show these pictures to those there. The eminent nuclear scientists of that day, 1967, were there at Berkeley. He wanted to show that. He wanted to find out their reaction, reaction and indeed what to do next. Very, very briefly as I close this evening, Glenn Seaborg opened the door for me to actually make a trip to the Soviet Union. He wrote a letter to the president of the Soviet Academy of Sciences in the midst of the Cold War for me to go over to the Soviet Union and to discuss with the scientists in the Soviet Union the nature of unusual radioactivity and the possible implications of that radioactivity for the discovery of unusual elements. We'll pick up on this again tomorrow evening. Thanks so much for being with us tonight. To order this fascinating video, call now 1-800-467-6380. That's 1-800-467-6380. Or visit the website at www.halos.com to order by check or credit card. Again, that's www.halos.com.